It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Sally here. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to compare and contrast various elements of the Enid to the Gosmals. Now, prior to the release of the Enid, there is no doubt in my mind that the Hermetic epics were really influential for Greco-Roman society and Hellenistic culture. And prior to, the, of course, the writing down of like the Hermetic epics like the Iliad and the Odyssey, it turns out that there's like a humongous influence from Gilgamesh to write the characters for that particular stories. Now, this particular document is called The Closer East, the Epic of Gilgamesh and Homer. It says right here, the influence of Near East on Greek culture from 1800 onwards is nowadays really disputed. The evidence is especially abundant in art and architecture in terms of adaptation of both technical skills and foreign motif, and it's also possible to identify major single phenomenon such as the acquisition and subsequent rendering by the Greeks of Semitic alphabet. Accordingly, these areas of intercultural exchange have been treated over the years, over the past 200 years or so, with due academic attention and guilt and extensive literature of the subject. The very first and most obvious similarity between the Epic of Gilgamesh and Hometic poems rests in the relationship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu, a chilies of Polocotropes. A mere friendship is insignificant to claim any correspondence, but both relationships display certain patterns that appear to underline the stories of heroes and their friends. Firstly, the men are not equals. The higher statuses of Gilgamesh and Achilles in reference to their respective companions are undisputed. Both protagonists not only descend from the highest status of atrocracy, a chili being a bustless, Gilgamesh a king, but they are also demigods single out and doom within their narratives precisely because of the burdens of the divine origins. Secondly, the closeness between each pair is particularly strong, transcending the usual effect of a heroic renderance. Pocalypse for Achilles, what Enkidu is for Gilgamesh, a friend whom he loves so dear, not coincidentally, the exceptional qualities of these bonds is revealed with the full force of emotion and death after the deaths of both Enkidu and Polokotropes. So while it's true that Gilgamesh directly influenced the Hermetic epics and the Hermetic epics later influenced Virgil, what are the similarities and the differences between both Virgil's story and the Gospels? One major idea for both stories is the fact that there's actually the depiction of Hades. Now, Hades is actually an underground place that's governed by the same god that's actually named Hades too, where all the souls, no matter their backgrounds, good or bad, are immediately judged for, like, you know, if they're actually good or bad. Now, Tartarus is actually a place where all the souls just burn forever and ever and ever, and also, when it comes down to the idea of heaven, in Greek mythology, there is something that is known as Ecolegium, where all the good souls just basically go there. Now, within both stories, it seems as though that to conflict the ideas of the Taurus and Hades and to make it into one place where all the souls, no matter their background, begins to burn directly in Hades. The sacred gates were swinging open. Do you see what manner of sentry guards the courtyard? What shape keeps safe the threshold? Inside there sits a hydra, a monster fiercer far, with fifty throats hungrily gaping. Then there is the abyss of Tartarus itself, falling sheer to the darkness, twice as far as an upward-looking eye can see from earth to heaven. And down there... In the uttermost depths, flung down by a thunderbolt, wallow that ancient race, the Titans, born of the earth. And here I saw the twin sons of Aloeus, 
Huge giants who with their own hands had tried to pull down the vault of heaven and dispossess almighty Jove of his kingdom. And I saw Salmoneus suffering cruel punishment. He had counterfeited the thunder of Olympus. Driving four horses, flourishing a torch, he went through the tribes of the Greeks. He went through the midst of the city of Elis in a triumph, demanding the homage only a god should have. Mad! If he thought that he could counterfeit with a rattle of brass and the beat of horny hooves, the storm cloud, the inimitable bolt, but the Almighty Father hurled his own bolt from the core of his clouds. It was no wispy, no smoky brand, and hurled him headlong down on the wings of a whirlwind. And there to be seen was Titius, child of the all-fostering earth, whose body lies stretched over nine acres, and a great vulture with its hooked beak plucks at his undying liver, and gripes his entrails, rich source of agony, mining its every meal from his deep heart perpetually, and giving no respite to the ever-renewing sinew. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Of course, you cannot have a fantastic story without men just walking on water. Now, for this case, it seems as though that when Mercury has the magic sandals on, he has the capability of just walking on water without any sort of problem. Meanwhile, of course, Jesus also has the capability of walking on water too. Mercury leapt to obey the Great Father's order. First he bound his golden sandals on, which, winged, carry him high over land or sea with the same dispatch. Then he took up his wand. With this he can summon a spirit up from Orcus, can post another down to Tartarus, give or withhold sleep, open the eye after death. With this cleave cloud, dog drive the wind. Now... Volplaning down, he saw the summit and flanks of grumly Atlas, who upholds the heavens with his head, whose locks of pine are shrouded in circlets of black cloud, and bristle with wind and rain. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. 
And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Another similarity is the idea of the sense of abandonment. When Jesus Christ was nailed on the cross, he said out loud, Father, Father, why have you abandoned me? Suggesting that he was actually abandoned by the God of the Bible. Meanwhile, for the case of the main character named Tunis in this particular story, it seems as though that what happened to him is very similar to what happened in the Iliad, where Hector was also basically abandoned by the gods during battle, and it turns out that Tunis is also abandoned directly from the gods in this particular story. And Tunis, as he fled, chid all the Rutulians, calling on each by name and clamoring for his own sword. But Aeneas threatened death and total destruction of the city if anyone dared to produce it. So none dared for terror. And on he thrust, despite the wound. Five times they circled, to and fro five bitter times. This was no exhibition match for a prize. They were fighting for Tunis's life, for his lifeblood. In the meanwhile, the all-powerful king of Olympus addressed Juno as she watched the battle, wrapped in a cold cloud. My wife, my queen... What is the end of this to be? What coup de gras have you in mind? You know, and admit you know, that Aeneas has his niche as a god in heaven. What is your place in that cold cloud? What are you plotting? Was it right a mortal should mar a god with a wound? And saving Juturna's aid, would he have his sword back? Should beaten Turnus have a new lease of life? Now at the last gasp, listen to my entreaties. Do not, I beg you, bite your lips and swallow resentment down so often in silence. Now is the moment of decision. You have had power to harry the Trojans, land and sea, to induce this loathsome war. To smirch a house and taint a wedding with pain. More I forbid completely. So Jove pronounced, and Juno with downcast eyes, Indeed, great lord, because I know it to be your will, I unwillingly withdraw my favour from Turnus, or you would not see me aloof, aloft alone, enduring whatever I must, deservedly or no. But, girl with flame, I would take my stand in the very battle line and force the Trojans into their enemies' hands. As for Juturna, I confess I urged her to go to the help of her hapless brother, approving deeds even greater if she could save his life, but never that she should wield a bow or spear. And now I swear by the source of the river Styx, that unappeasable spring, the one sanction that binds us gods above. I, for my part, withdraw and quit this detestable battle. But I beg one boon forbidden by no laws of fate. I sue for Latium and the dignity of a race that is your own, when peace at last is ratified by a happy marriage, and a treaty of mutual alliance made, so be it. Then, my lord, let it not be your will to force the Latins to change their ancient name in their own land. Let them not be Trojans. Let them not change their language or their way of dress. Let Latium still stand. Let Alban kings in endless dynasties reign there, 
and steady from Italian stock a breed of Romans arise. But Troy has fallen, so let her lie fallen, her name with her. Smiling, the father of mankind and the world made answer, Own true sister of Jove indeed, and child of Saturn also, so high the seas of passion surging in your breast. But come, quell this frenzy that you have indulged in vain. I grant your petition. You have gained your way, and willingly I obey you. Tunus was paralyzed with a strange terror. His hair stood on end, and his voice stuck in his throat. But when Jutuna recognized from afar the pulse of the Fury's wings, the wretched nymph in her sister's throes scored her cheeks with her nails, beat her breast, and plucked at her loosened hair. What help can your sister bring you now, Tunus? And what is to be my fate after such long endurance? What art have I to prolong your life? Can I range my powers against such a monster? Now, now I must quit the field. You disgusting birds of ill omen do not appall me more. I am afraid already. I know the beat of your wings with its sound of death. It is the overmastering will of Jove. I cannot fail to see it. Is this the reward for my lost virginity? Why did he give me the gift of eternal life? Oh, why was the law of death annulled for me? Else I could put an end to this tale of anguish, now, at this very instant, and hand in hand with my wretched brother go to death's dark house. Is this my immortality? Will there be any joy in life bereft of you, my brother? Oh, that a gulf might open deep enough in the earth to swallow me, for all I am a goddess, down to the shades. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The notion and idea of praying is very essential for both the immediate and the Gospels because for the case of Jesus Christ, we do know that as soon as he was born, there was actually a person that basically prayed over him. And during the battle for the case of the last book of the immediate, what we do know is that Thomas also prayed to the Greek gods during battle to actually protect somebody else while he was fighting blood. It happened a bitter-leaved wild olive tree sacred to Faunus once had flourished here. Now it was just a stump revered by sailors who, saved from the sea, were used to fasten to it their votive offerings to their Laurentine god, their dedicated robes. But the gross Trojans, having no reverence for this god, had felled it to level the lists for the fight. And in this trunk Aeneas's spear stuck fast, as it had flown of its own momentum. Now it was stuck fast, and Aeneas stood over it, and heaved and wrenched, needing to throw it after a foe too fleet for him to close with. Turnus, mad with fear, prayed to the god, O oh, Faunus, pity me, and you, dear native soil, hold fast the spear if I have kept you in reverence when these Trojans impiously have defiled you by this invasion. His prayers were not in vain. The god came to his aid. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, 
Now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them, and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. During the battle for Daniliad, Venus had the capability of healing somebody during battle while they were still hurt. While for the case of Jesus Christ, what he did that he saw a woman who was basically bleeding, and it turns out that as soon as that woman just touched Jesus, she automatically healed from her touching his clothes. Nothing Aeneas could do with all his might could budge the spear from the vice of the holy wood. And while he wrenched and heaved at it, Jutuna, once more in the guise of Metiscus, darted up and gave her brother his proper sword again. Venus, furious at the license given this minor goddess, loosed the spear from the bowl, and the two heroes, refreshed in body, rearmed, Turnus wielding his sword, Aeneas his long spear, bristled opposed again under the sway of Mars. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. For the case of the Gospels, Jesus Christ has the ability to calm the water when he was there with the twelve disciples, and Eliud has the capability to also calm the sea, but used the power against those that were on boats during that whole entire sequence for the first chapter. Jove the king thrust them down into subterranean dark, heaped mountains on them, and over them set a lord whose genius lay in his power to adjust them to the nicety of his king's wishes. And to him it was that Juno, speaking humbly, made her plea. Aeolus, you were granted by the father of gods and king of men the faculty of calming wind and wave. Now listen to me. A people I abominate are afloat on the Tuscan Sea, bearing to Italy Troy and its conquered gods. Now lash the sea to frenzy, shatter their ships and sink them, scatter them utterly, so the deep sea furrows with all their bodies. I have twice seven nymphs, all beautiful, most beautiful Diopea, and for this favour she shall be yours for life in proper marriage, and bear your family. Eolus answered, Goddess, it is your destiny to ensue your will. My duty is to obey it. My kingdom is in your gift, my place at your feasts. You make me sib to almighty Jove. My dominion over storm and cloudburst emanates from you. When he had said this, he turned his stave over and dug it into the ribs of the mountain. Then 
the winds snuffing an outlet as if in assault order, swelled out and swept the land in a hurricane, whirled on the sea and whisked it deep to its bed. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. One final comparison is the idea of the pigs within both stories. There's actually a witch that is known as Celsi, who makes an appearance in Metamorphosis, as well as the Odyssey. When the soldier of Odysseus went to the island, they first were attacked by Cyclops, and then some of the members that were part of Odysseus' trip were also seducted and subdued by Celsi, and it turns out that they basically turn into pigs. Half dead with thirst, we drank the cup the Circe handed us, and she, as if to give us further honors, she lightly touched our hair. She seemed to crown us with one stroke of her wand. Drunk. Was I drunk? I hate to say how drunk, but might as well. The floor beneath me slipped, and there I was with pigskin growing on me, tough and hairy, grunting and snouted, thick-necked and mired. And hands that held the drink up to my lips were trotters that smeared dirt along the floor. They shut me in a pin. Most of the rest of us were there, pigs like myself, for the drink had power enough to pig an army. Only straight Eurylochus stayed erect, and still a man who had turned down his drink. If he had not, I'd be a pig today, for he escaped to fetch Ulysses too. Now she makes a direct appearance in the Aeneid, but this time it seems as though that the people that were near her turn into various other kind of creatures that are not necessarily pigs. So when good Aeneas had dutifully performed the final rites and built a barrow, he watched for calm weather, then set sail from the port. A fair breeze blew nightward on, the white moon lit their way, and the sea sparkled in her quivering rays. They coasted close in to the land of Circe, the daughter of the sun, whose grove forever thrills with the sound of singing in its vastness, whose splendid halls are lit against the night with fragrant cedar wood, as through the delicate warp she threads her rattling shuttle. They could hear the angry snarl of lions chafed by their chains and roaring into the midnight, the fume and fury of bristled boars and bears in cages, the howling of monstrous wolves, all these were human beings. Circe, the cruel goddess, had transformed by her powerful drugs into the shapes and forms of wild beasts. Now for Jesus Christ, what happened was that he cast demons into a bunch of pigs, and all the pigs just fell down and basically just died to their death. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled, and went their ways into the city, and told everything, and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. What do you guys think about this comparison? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's
it's Tyler.